first of all, uh, yes, before I start, I want to uh, firstly thank uh, uh, Mahendra for uh, giving me the uh, opportunity to speak. I came about fairly fortuitously through contacts, as he says, uh, in Sri Lankan circles, it's often said that uh, the degrees of separation are uh, only sometimes uh, only two or three away. It's always someone that you know. So it's a great honor to, to be given some time to talk about something that I'm really passionate about. And um, I'll <clears throat> introduce myself to start and then, and, and then we'll get into the, the subject matter. Uh, I'm hoping it's, it's, it's not going to be um, laborious, um, certainly. I want to keep the presentation short to try and pro provide some opportunity for questioning um, um, as you as we go along. So, so I'm going to. This is what I'm going to be um, sharing. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and and the main body of the presentation really is about. So what's the problem? Do we have a problem in healthcare? Uh, because if we don't have a problem, then we don't need a solution. So I'm going to briefly touch on that. I'm going to, by nature, the, the, the subject involves some degree of technology. So uh, I just ask that your patient through that process as I um, outline some of the possibilities and some of the excitement around what are fairly disruptive technologies, uh, what, that, what I mean by that is that it's going to completely change uh, medicine and the way we deliver it, the way we care for patients. And that's already started. Uh, and I'll give you some of the reasons why that needs to be the case. But even if you forget all of that, I'm going to end with a personal story, an application story. And I think, you know, we are by, by nature humans um, connect when you talk about stories. And this is a very personal story and how uh, one person can have an influence and can change things. And, uh, you know, until we are dead, we are alive and we can't not sort of have a full go at, at, at living your day completely and with passion uh, because that's what we're here to do. Um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time uh, to spend talking about uh, answering questions, uh, uh, if that's the preference for you in the audience. I would like to talk about a lot of things, but clearly I'm going to do a flyby. There are some very exciting things happening and uh, some of them would be, you'd be familiar with some of the gene technology area, the, the genetics and how we are learning that we can tailor treatments to each individual patient. Now for many years, we've treated uh, uh, humans in groups and in, in, in uh, like the herd mentality, you know, we've applied medicine in a herd mentality and we know that that's not really uh, the case. Uh, it may be best fit, but we are now learning that we can in fact individually tailor treatments to suit each individual person in a bespoke fashion. And that's very exciting. And I'm not going to be talking about that. Uh, I mean, can you imagine that in a few years, we can in fact get an organ to fit you. Let's say your kidney is failing or your heart's failing. We can, by tissue printing, we can in fact genetically match and get an organ that you could, you could have. And this is the possibility we're talking about. We're talking about the future of medicine and, and behind closed doors, those, um, those initiatives are progressing. Uh, and, and I won't be talking about that, but I will be talking a little bit about myself. I was born in Sri Lanka to, um, um, my father was a, a Tamil, my mother was a Sinhalese. That was an unusual combination at that time. Uh, they were not wealthy people. Uh, my father in particular was very traditional. He believed that the only thing you can give a child is his education. And so he, uh, he instilled in us uh, a work ethic to really work hard that, uh, uh, you know, values uh, and, and, and some of those thinking behind uh, living is what I gained from them. And I'm always grateful. I, uh, lost my mother when I was in my first year in med school. 
a, a very very sad um, uh, uh, situation. I was I was only eighteen. Uh, I was just eighteen, going on nineteen, and I I thought I'd never recover from that. Uh, but thankfully, uh, they say that you know for to, to bring up a child, you need a village, and so my relatives. Uh, you know, came came in. They supported me and saw me through med school. And there were troubled times. Uh, this picture of me sitting um, uh, is was particularly not a very pleasant time as I worked through the death of my parents. Both died within a short period of time. Um, um, this is my family. I have three children. Uh, I live in Melbourne, Australia. I've been here now since 1986. Um, and my daughter um, uh, is an intensivist. She's just finishing off her in intensive care training. My son's an architect. Um, and my youngest has just uh, completed her law degree and, and is finishing off her law exams. Um, I enjoy a variety of different things. You know, medicine is, can be quite a selfish game it's between you and your patient and time disappears and you could work all day as you know and all weekends and so forth but i have uh, i have tried to get a mix of things interests that i follow and fishing and uh, and water skiing and, and 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 as you get older now you've got to try and find a sport that uh, you can engage in so i i ride my bike with my son and uh, that's been a great fun I like photography. This is a, a picture of a, a lion from the from Africa, and it was one of those, you know, lifelong ambitions to travel to Africa. And I like the whole mixture between uh, electronics and uh, art and creativity in photography. So that's an area of my interest. I don't know about you, but for me, there are some heroes if you and i'm sure that each of you has a hero that you can connect with and my hero or one of my heroes was this particular gentleman sir roy khan he was a surgeon uh, in the 1950s and 60s and he was a pioneer and as soon as you are a pioneer you run into all sorts of trouble because just as much as you are pushing the boundaries and trying to do things, others will find often be threatened. Uh, they, don't, they, they don't want someone coming along and trying to disrupt their fairly stable run. Now, Roy Khan's uh, claim to fame was that he was a transplant specialist and he undertook the first liver transplants in Oxford. Oxford and when he first did his transplants, uh, he, he, as a young doctor, he, he found these patients as he was rounding the hospitals, people dying of uh, various ailments and liver disease and end stage liver failure was one of those. And he told his boss, surely there must be something that can be done. And his boss said, well, there's, there's really nothing much that can be done. And so Sir Roy started on a quest to do transplants and everyone, found fault with him and said that he was in fact it, it, it is it is rumored that at night his phone would ring and when he answered it it would be a relative of someone where he'd harvested the organs and they'd said they'd say to him you, you just kill my relative uh, we're gonna get you in fact that's not the case the the relative we were talking about was in fact brain dead and, uh, uh, and, and assessed as such by several individual practitioners. And what he was doing was doing, using the organs to, to help someone else live. And it said that uh, it's, it's, it's rumored that no one wanted to help him. And so he would put the organ on the back of his motorbike, travel between hospitals and put the organ into the other patient. And I'm sure in the first few that he did, patients didn't survive. And then as he was experimenting, he found a drug uh, you know, by chance that would stop the rejection process and, and transplant surgery uh, was birthed out of that. And Sir Roy Khan, if not for the fact that he stood by his guns in what he believed, we would not have liver transplantation surgery today. So that's the nature of the man that I think uh, certainly warrants 
a lifetime achievement and he's a pride of Britain. You know, this is the best of British, if you like. Uh, and uh, so I just thought I'd, I'd just mention that. I went to school in Sri Lanka. Um, you know, uh, my parents weren't well to do. Um, they, they uh, I'm sure, survived from one <coughs> paycheck to the next. But my father in particular, I think just about mortgaged his soul to send me to private school uh, and believe that that's, that was all I was going to get. There was nothing more. And I'm always thankful to uh, my alma mater and where values and, and uh, again, you know, of, of the preciousness of life and, and uh, uh, the zeal to do, to live your passion was inculcated. And I'm always grateful uh, for that. So I graduated in 1983 uh, uh, because I was on mixed parentage. My parents were luckily, uh, thankfully, they were dead at that time. Uh, I was caught up in all of the, the stuff that went on. And given that my father was a Tamil and his name was easily identified, they looked to actually slit my throat and do away with me. And I uh, graduated, my, I was caught up in the riots. Uh, my house, my parents' house was burnt and I had to borrow a suit to graduate. Um, I didn't have a tie. I don't know how I made it. I think emotionally I was quite traumatized by it, but still committed to stay in Sri Lanka until uh, a few months after there was this undertones that things were not going to be the same. I don't want to dwell on that. I thought, okay, I think it's time to move. I had a brother who lived in the United Kingdom. And he said to me, all right, you're going to just get a plane ticket. I'm going to, and I said, I don't have the money to do that. So he paid for my ticket and I, and I traveled to Britain and, you know, Britain had this policy of accepting doctors. Uh, one can say it's for their own good, but anyway, I got there. I managed to finish, uh, complete the exams and to work in Britain for some time. In 1986, an opportunity came to travel to Australia and, and to live there. My wife's mom traveled here, became a citizen on the back of uh, those 83 uh, riots. And so I traveled to Australia. The graduation and, and licensing uh, was tricky, but, but anyway, um, I got there and I finished my training. So currently I'm in <coughs> private practice. I, um, I work with a group uh, of surgeons. Uh, group practices are, are very norm here. Uh, individual practices are dying out, simply won't survive in the long term. So I work uh, in the private sector. Uh, I'm involved with, uh, you know, uh, the advocacy and management side of things as I get older. I have university affiliations. I have a college of surgeons affiliation. I do teaching and advocacy. I supervise a master's course in surgery. And I also, and this is where Professor Ramesh Nagaraja, who's thankfully with us tonight, is also uh, part of this, or was until recently part of the Swinburne University Group. For which I'm, I'm associated and affiliated on research projects, and I'm also uh, attached to Monash University. Uh, I do some undergraduate teaching uh, there. My um, research and special interests are: uh, I, I am interested in robotic surgery, in her hernia surgery, and research, uh, and a variety of other things, which I'm not going to spend much time. So let's just talk about the topic uh, today. And uh, I was sort of thinking about how we should sort of approach this. And really digital surgery, that's what it's called, is, is, is not new. We've had it around for 20 years. But, so but what's new? I mean, what's changing? And what will change the landscape of, of care from a surgeon's point of view and as, as a patient, uh, from a patient's point of view, I suppose. And, and the buzzword is democrat, democratization of treatment. That is access to surgery. Are we, having, are we having a system that provides access to surgery? Now, I, I know in Britain, and I don't know the system as much as I know it in Australia anyway, the waiting time for some procedures can be five years or more. Uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a developed world, in 2020, that's absurd. That is ridiculous. 
that patients are living with chronic pain, uh, particularly with uh, waiting joint replacement and other elective procedures. Uh, and they, they're in pain because simply we cannot provide the access that they require. That has to change. We can't, we can't keep doing that and saying to people, well, simply, no, there's nothing that we can do. You just have to wait. We have to understand the person, patient perspectives. And often this is where we have gone wrong as doctors. We have thought that what we thought was what the patient needed was what was needed. And in fact, we're learning that often that's not the case. And the patient's perspective is quite different. If you ask them and if you only listen, uh, what they prioritize as important is quite different to sometimes what doctors think is. Now, this is becoming increasingly, uh, uh, I guess, focused on because of something that I'll, I'll allude to call value care. And uh, we've treated this incorrectly, and we're, we're only starting to learn this quite late, that that needs a correction, it needs a reboot. One of the things we haven't also looked at is surgeon health. And so what's happening to these people that's giving you your treatment? How, how are they faring? What's their health like? And for surgeons, we're finding that up to 30% of, of surgeons are, either have a chronic injury as a result of the type of surgery they, they undertake from various um, reasons. And that contributes to burnout. In Australia, a recent study say, uh, showed that up to nearly 50 to 70% of surgeons um, uh, are experiencing burnout. That is where they feel really not motivated, they are discouraged. And so you might say, well, that's their problem. Well, actually it is the patient's problem because if you have a surgeon who's burnt out, you're going to have poor outcomes. So we're starting to look at that as, as, a, as a stand alone. So what is, uh, you know, most people know about open surgery, you know, that's the, that's the surgery that we've had for hundreds of years. It's come through a fairly uh, iterative process, uh, using the knife, opening up, getting in there and fixing the problem. But in the 1980s, there was a change and we realized that perhaps we could do this differently. And so surgery 2.0, that's the laparoscopic or keyhole surgery as, as most people would know, came into being. And that came out of the need to actually get the patient out of hospital and back doing what they want to do and back into the workforce as quickly as possible with minimal downside, downtime, uh, while establishing keeping to those principles that have been established over hundreds of years. So for example, you couldn't compromise cancer care just because you wanted to try and do it keyhole. You have to be able to justify that the keyhole of operation could clear the cancer just as well. So we've been through that. And then as we refined and changed that we've come, we came to realize, well, there were some limitations there because Keyhole surgery came out of traditional open surgery and there were some limitations. Could we overcome some of those limitations? And so robotic surgery, and I'll talk a little bit about the history of robotic surgery and <clears throat> because that's an area of interest and, and particularly looking as horizon scanning, when you look ahead, it's going to become increasingly more popular feature more and become the standard. Uh, of, of by which we work. And of course, now we're going to surgery 4.0, which is bringing in computing power and all of that added, uh, the added power that computing brings, the connectivity, the internet, uh, artificial intelligence, and all of that now is coming together to actually completely change surgery as we traditionally knew it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of those applications are because that's where the excitement is. So I said to you that there is a problem and, and this, is the, this is the issue at heart. If there was no problem, we didn't need tools. We don't need new, new technology with all of its expenses and so forth. As much as it's nice and it's progress, 
we, we don't need it. It's more expensive and more costly. But we know that we can't operate the same way. And that's because healthcare has become so expensive. Uh, and while not providing what we call quality care, and if you look at the United States, for example, the uh, average per capita expenditure is one of the highest in the world. But if you take over a broad uh, uh, population, the delivery of healthcare is actually not the best. And uh, that graph shows that, that the highest spend expenditure may not necessarily give you the best return. And so in the Time magazine uh, recently, there was an article about, you know, the expense, the cost of medical care and the bills and an average tablet of Tylenol would be somewhere in the uh, approximate cost of $10 when it really should cost only a couple of cents. So there is some extra padding and, and, and some of this stuff that we'll need to sort out. We can't keep going like this. We simply cannot afford it. And increasingly, we are becoming more focused on quality of care. So in the past, most doctors, most hospitals are paid on volume. You do more cases, we pay you more. And there's a, there's a full stop now there. And people are asking, well, that shouldn't be, shouldn't be the game, end game. The end game would be what's the quality of care you're delivering? And how do you ensure that quality and what's the cost of that? Uh, activity and that is what we should pay and re remunerate the hospitals and uh, medical staff etc there are other reasons for that but that's something that's really going to change uh, or is already changing uh, particularly in some parts of the world over the other and so when it comes to digital surgery I, I wanted to uh, show you that if you want to read a book on where technology is going and where computing power is and what the next phase is. You know, it's not going to be in the microchip. That, that's going to change. And it's going to change here around the 2050 mark. And there'll be computers that you can buy for the price of what you pay for your refrigerator that has the power, computing power of all human brains. That's the collective human brains put together. So it's exponentially growing and it will shift and change everything that we do. There are some risks we need to manage, but it's not going to be the microchip. It's these nanotubes and nanotube circuitry and molecular computing and such that is going to bring this power to bear. And as, as computing power increases, the things we're able to do with it also will will change. I, I'm going to take a slight detour here and tell you about something that we're really learning and we're starting to understand how we're going to change the paradigm. And we call it this learning healthcare system. Basically, the, 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 the engineers and scientists know about this. And if you go to Toyota in Japan or BMW in Germany, they do this all the time. What they do is they, they, they plan, they do, they collect the data, they act, and then they close the circle behind them, continuously improving the care, uh, continuously improving the processes that, for example, building a car. This they've known since 19, the 1960s and 70s, immediately after World War II, Japan put sort of similar steps in place. Now in medicine, We've never understood that this is what we need to do. We need to plan, do, collect the data, act on that, grind the data together, then redo the whole thing over and over again to, to improve the quality of care. And so this is not new. This is now coming into operation and we're finding that this is going to be the standard of how we're going to um, deliver care, but there'll be research embedded in that process. So you might ask, well, what's the benefit? Can you outline one? There are many benefits, but one of the main ones is that it's a culture of collaboration, everybody working together. Now, I don't know how much you've been uh, interacting with the healthcare system, but the healthcare system is made up of silos. One specialist won't talk to the other. 
the physio doesn't know what the other person, and it's always disparate in silos. We're saying that can't exist. It has to work together, mesh together. And this sort of system forces people to collaborate. And, and so I think this is necessarily the only way we are going to integrate, bring together teams around patients, bring the cost down, improving the quality of care as we go along, individualizing. So it's not one treatment doesn't fit all. It's individualized for that particular person. And that depends on your genetics and your underlying conditions and you know, the resources available to you and so forth. So it's an exciting time because it's completely new. <clears throat> Understanding this is that, you know, as surgeons, I, I didn't understand this, but, you know, we are also leaders and managers. And, and uh, so I took time out. I went and did a master's in uh, leadership and management. And I, and I you know, it, it took me time, effort, and money to do that. But I, I started to understand that as, and we don't do this in med school. In medical school, you're just pumped full of facts. Instead, the, the, the interviews that we have now to choose medical students are more about uh, emotional content and emotional quotient and how are they going to deal with someone who's sick and not just purely based on knowledge. This is really interesting because this is a change again, a shift from just filling someone with facts and letting them go to actually birthing people who are leaders to understand their role, interact with people, work in a team collaboratively and so forth. Um, I just want to allude to the fact that, you know, as, as medical people, and I, I think this applies to any field, whether it be medicine, the science, or engineering, is that it takes a village. It takes your wife to particularly sacrifice and, and to provide you with the opportunity. And my wife has done that. Uh, She's taken the role of caring for family when I'm away and so forth. And I'm very grateful for that because there's no way that I could have done it otherwise. Um, you know, Steve Jobs is often mentioned as, as a bad person, but you know, there were some, there were some really good things that he said. And one thing we need to understand is technology is not everything. But when we start to use technology and understand that, have faith in people, build teams, and you empower them, you see, you get people that will run and never stop. And that's what leadership in medicine so desperately needs. It's not people who work like cowboys. We need people who work like people in the Pit, if you look at the Grand Prix, the pit crew, they all work together. They have got one goal, and that's to see that car win. We need a change in medicine. We need it so desperately. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's something that's so desperately needed. Uh, and there's a lot of commentary about that sort of thing. And, and so it is it even with technology. You know, technology is not going to get us across. But once we assemble people around the patient, and use that technology as a tool, we really bring power to bear. So putting a computer between a, you know, the surgeon, the doctor, and the patient, that's what digital surgery is about. And data by self, is con it's confusing unless you have the power to crunch those numbers and get meaningful analytics and so forth. Um, you know, we have a variety of different ways. I won't spend time on that, but let's have a look at a couple of applications because this is where the rubber meets the road. So what, how is it? What, what are the applications? What are some of the newer things that are, are starting to um, feature? Let me just draw uh, one example. So one of the common things that doctors encounter is shadows in the lung. This is a common occurrence. Uh, as you get older, as uh, humans get older, often we come across these shadow in the lung. You have a, some reason to have an x-ray and you got a shadow. And of course, immediately the question is, is that serious? Is that a cancerous growth or not? And doctors have had this dilemma where you can't simply go in and take a piece easily because the lung is pretty fragile. Accessing it can be difficult because it's at the end of air passages and so forth. So let me show you a little video about um, uh, how this problem, so there was a problem. We identified a problem, 
we need a solution. So what's the solution? Let's see how we this uh, video will play. What if you could extend your reach and advance your bronchoscopic capabilities? More than 70% of nodules for biopsy are far out in the peripheral lung. For those patients, doctors haven't had a first choice technology to turn to until now. Introducing ION from Intuitive, the makers of DaVinci Robotic Surgical Systems. ION is a robotic assisted platform for minimally invasive biopsy. Its thin, maneuverable catheter and unprecedented stability can advance your bronchoscopic capabilities and extend your reach. ION is flexible, allowing navigation far into the peripheral lung. ION is precise, delivering accurate biopsies of hard to reach nodules, even outside airways. ION is stable. Its unique sensing technology enables active control of the catheter position. So you, you can see here, in the normal course of events, sometimes that would mean a cut in the chest, an invasive operation to get to something at the end of which we would say to someone, oh, well, sorry, but uh, that really wasn't anything serious, but we've had to make a cut to get to it. So identify the problem, a solution, and then the robotics and the new technology people came along and said, okay, well, we'll we can sort this out. And so we can get that biopsy without subjecting that patient to the invasive surgery that was required. So this is the sort of capability that we're talking about. And one of the questions that I'm asked is, so with these new therapies, gene therapy and drug treatment, and in the face of advances in various energy therapies and physical in interventions, will surgery remain the main setting? Will it remain the main frame? And the answer to that is in the main, in the main, to say, no, surgeons will never be replaced. Now, I don't know about you, but if you ever notice that when you've flown in an airline, there's almost, that's almost lands itself. It's, it's, it's run by a computer. But it doesn't, it does never mean that the pilot's never going to be in that cockpit. It's the same way. We're going to be enabled. There's going to be a variety of tools and, 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 automated processes better than us, better than what we can do, but we'll need to be, have a presence there. And so uh, in the short term, anyway, in the next century or so, <coughs> surgeons will always be uh, um, in, in, that, in that same sphere. Okay, so this is another technology. So, uh, uh, you know, one of the issues with us is, with surgery is to get a human hand. The human hand is very capable, it's dexterous, it's got feeling, uh, it's, it's a very, very sophisticated piece of equipment, but it's got limitations. The amount of movement that your hand can make, the space you require to get into, to use your hand are limitations in itself. So imagine like if you had a cancer in your throat and you had to get in there and remove it. Now, We've not been able to do that. So what we do is major disfiguring surgery where we open the mouth and make it like a butterfly uh, flap, get in there, and this is very disfiguring, but there was no alternative. But, so, we went Indra, to engine. Indra, my, the screen has gone blank. Are, are you okay? No, okay? I'm not playing it. I'm not playing. I'm just playing a video now. I'm playing a video, just a minute. So, we needed some way to get over this problem. So again, we went to the engineers because the engineers are the clever people and said, okay, tell us how you're going to do this. So this is what's called a single port robot. It's got a single tube. You can put that in through an incision and then you get these arms radiating out for it with all of the tools and tricks and trades and whatever the surgeon needs. So now we can attack that growth without the disfiguring surgery, but with all of the tools necessary to cut, seal, sew, and get clearance of that tumor and access areas which simply my human hand can't reach. So once again, technology and working with robotics and 
So you can see how within such a close space, you can have these instrument. My hand can't reach that. It simply, it, there's not enough space to work. Um, I want to uh, highlight another area. Now, one of, the, one of the things that has happened in the last 20 years is that the general confidence in medical practitioners, there's a recent study uh, in Australia where they did a survey and they asked uh, people in, in, in the general community, who would you trust most? And they gave a list of people, your accountant, your lawyer, the uh, ambulance man, the doctor, and the accountant. And they said, rate them from one to five. And I can tell you that the doctors did not rate in the first two. So there has been a lack, a loss of confidence in doctors. There are multiple reasons for this. And one of the reasons is that we need to get our training sorted out differently. So when we get surgeons coming through, they're not working through the learning curve, etc. And this is where, again, computing analytics and the power of computing can help us. And so CSATs is one of those modalities that can be used to train people. So you might say, well, what does, what does that matter? Well, it matters because if we can train someone better, it means lower inpatient uh, stay, is a shorter period, in, because the surgeon's better skilled at doing something. We can get them up to speed quicker. <clears throat> and, and there are multiple benefits going down to even reducing costs. And so I want to show you a little video of how CSATs work. CSATs is one of those platforms that help train surgeons differently. So let me uh, play the video and um, let it explain. The itself. power of learning, the power of analytics, the power of peer review. CSATS helps you harness these powers in efforts to make surgery safer. A surgical skills improvement platform, CSATS is powered by data analytics and human insights to promote learning, sharing, and mentoring. With CSATS, you can capture and store your surgical videos, uncover valuable insights, benchmark yourself, and share your expertise in a secure and vetted community of peers on a global scale. CSAT's personalized and HIPAA compliant library of case reports. So what, what that's allowing us to do is to have oversight over someone's skill. Now, I don't know, I, I have a story to tell that uh, when, when I trained as a young doctor, I heard of this surgeon, very eminent, very skilled, who had a major illness themselves. They had a pancreatic cancer. He went off duty. He had treatment. And six months later, he suddenly reappeared and he was operating. And I wondered what process had he gone through uh, to ensure that he was safe to start operating again? I mean, you wouldn't do that with a pilot, would you? Just get him back and say, right, you're going to fly from New York to London. Uh, you had a heart attack three months ago, but yeah, you'll be fine. Just get on the con controls and you'll be good. No, you can't do that anymore. We, we simply cannot accept that situation. And CSATS allows us to uh, uh, assess that surgeon's capacity, capability there, perhaps get them up to speed with some more training and stuff to get them back. So you can see again, uh, another capability that computing AI peer review allows us, and this is new technology again playing in. And so people say, oh, but that's really threatening. I mean, there'd be, but, but, you do that in an embedded community, so it's completely private. No one else gets to see it apart from your peer who's assessing you and so forth. So there are checks and balances that you can put in place uh, to provide the necessary robustness to ensure that this is not a witch hunt. It's actually technology can be used in an effective way, in a quarantine way to provide and to no, give, give you the sort of questions you're asking. Uh, I want to uh, do a couple more and then we'll just move on because I don't want to spend too much time on the technical stuff. Now, the operating room has changed. In the last 20 years, the operating, if, you, if you'd walked into an operating room 20 years ago and you walked into one now, you, you wouldn't recognize it. It's all high-tech computing, uh, 
<laughs> systems in place, in, in embedded, interactive, and so forth, variety of different skills. And one of the things we've been interested in is, so with all we can see is with our naked eye, are there other tools and, and tricks we can use to help the surgeon? For example, he's going to join two bits of tissue together. How would he ensure that those bits of tissue are going to heal? What about the blood supply? Because we can't see the blood supply, of course. But there are now imaging, new imaging technologies embedded into the operating room. We can flick a switch, put a dye into the patient, and then we can say with some degree of safety that those two bits of tissue have got the blood supply to heal. You know, this is a small problem in, in the context of the big problems, but still a vital piece. And again, technology is helping us do that. So, so we've transitioned from human understanding. We've got all the smart instruments and the gadgetry that goes with it. We've got all the digital insights and that's what's gonna change. It's gonna to come together and change the paradigm. And you might say, but look, uh, you know, it's a bit expensive. Who is gonna come up with all of this money? Because uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I've tried to think of uh, uh, writing a letter to BMW and saying, well, after all, it's only a car. Can you re reduce your price down so there's a price match with a Ford? Well, at the first come out of the rank, he's gonna pay the most amount of money until we get all. But if you look at the digital surgery uh, world, there are big players coming in through the gate. And you have to ask the question, why is that? Because they see the potential. And so I want to highlight one of the areas and that's in robotics. And this player, Johnson & Johnson and Google collaboration is massive. It's so exciting because they have removed themselves from the cost issue. They are not constrained by the, I mean, they, of course, there are, uh, economics that operate at one level, but at another level, they're saying, well, look, that's not the end game. The end game is looking for the solution, the problem and the solution. We're not going to be worried about the financial situation on the way. And that's brought a completely refreshing, another take on, on, on new technology. And if you look at Verb, which is the the, 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 the collaborative effort between Johnson & Johnson and Google. I mean, everyone knows Google. Everyone does know Johnson & Johnson. They're a big medical company, but they've partnered, come together to explore all of this new technology, robotics, instrumentation, connectivity, uh, you know, the ability for patients to connect with their doctor. That, that's not something we, we're used to, but it's such becoming such a critical matter the wearable stuff that you can wear on your hand and the doctor can monitor you, that sort of possibility uh, opening up all of that. So robotic surgery, and I want to talk a little bit and then I'll just start to close down on my presentation. Robotic surgery is a completely new and exciting field, again, brought on because there were a problem. I said to you that we've identified that we're going from surgery 1.0 to three, the hand, keyhole surgery and then robotics. And <laughs> in the last 20 to 30 years, there's been a rapid escalation in terms of robotic technology and the application. In 1985 was the first operation. It was using an industrial robot. I mean, to think about it now, my, my, uh, my friend, uh, Professor Ramesh uh, uh, Nagaraja would be astounded to know that they just took one off the shelf and hooked it up and did a brain biopsy with it. That was the start of robotic surgery. And then the, the US government funded massively into robotics, not because they wanted to, 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 you know, to develop robotic surgery, but basically they were looking at a way out of protecting their high value asset, surgeons removing them from the frontline war. You know, when there was a war front, they wanted to not put the surgeon right in the front front line, they wanted to operate from behind the uh, safe line so that they would protect their high value asset. But that then turned out into robotic surgery. And in 2019, there are over 5,000 systems, 6 million surgeries done globally and so forth. So we looked at this and thought, okay, well, we, when I looked at it, it was about 10 years ago, 
and I thought, well, there's no textbook. You can't go back to med school and start learning it. You have to learn this now on the run. So we made a decision. We took to the took to look at how one would train. Um, the the main centers in the U.S. were called epicenters. There were three of them. Now there are thirty of them. So I traveled to Houston. I saw the first robot, and then we came back and I approached the hospital system we are working and said, "Look, we really need to get this. This is a three point five million dollar bit of equipment." <laughs> and because of my association with them, they they said, "Yeah, okay, let, let's put a business case," and we got one. And so we have. Uh, work with it. So I'm just going to show a little clip of uh, robotic surgery and what, what that means is I am not standing over the patient. I'm removed from the patient. I'm sitting at a console operating some instrument and the robot has got arms that manipulate tissue and do all of the sort of stuff that we want it to do. So let me just uh, let, let the video run. And... Uh, So that's the console I'm sitting at. I'm looking at a monitor. These are tiny little instruments I put in. And you'll see the robot itself. That's the robot there with arms. It can fix onto uh, bits of equipment that manipulate tissue, cut, so you can have a variety. Anything you want done, it can do inside. But with the capability beyond the human hand very high definition pictures, clarity, uh, and so forth. That allows us to do things that are not simply possible with the human hand or with traditional keyhole surgery. So you might ask, well, what are the benefits? Well, there are lots of perceived benefits. You know, shorter hospital time, lower risks, faster recovery, less pain, less blood loss, quicker return to normal activity. Now, are they proven and hard and fast? No, we, we haven't. Some of the answers are still coming. We're still gathering that data to prove those, uh, uh, those value um, uh, uh, items that we're talking about. But one of the things that we've come to understand is, so what about the surgeon? We've left the surgeon uh, out of this equation. We're looking after the patient, that's our focus. Is there a problem with the, with the surgeon? And we found that, as I said to you before, about 30% of surgeons were uh, experiencing work-related injury because of poor ergonomics. That means their bodies are going into various angles and stresses on their joints. Some were prematurely ending their career. So we partnered with Swinburne University and we looked at how can we see if Robotic surgery is gentler for the surgeon. Does it protect their joints? You see, I'm sitting at a console rather than standing up and operating. My hands are in a very neutral position. The robot can do all sorts of things. It can go into angles and contortions that my human body can't. So we, did a, we, are, we are currently in the middle of uh, uh, some work looking at the looking at the benefits. So this is an avatar. This is sensors that I'm wearing. These two are sensors. And this avatar is a, is a, a computer generated model that tells me what my arms are going through, how my arms, how my joints reacting to, to the maneuvers that I'm making, how much stress are the muscles. We put an EMG sensors on them. Uh, Professor Romesh's team and I have been working on this, we, we are measuring the strain on the muscles. Because what we are finding is, once you keep straining after a pipe, the muscle, muscle fatigues and the muscle stops working. If you continue to work, it damages your muscles and damages your joints. Now, if robotics can improve that, well, we are value adding. Not only are we improving the patient's outcome, but we are protecting the surgeon. So this is, uh, a really um, exciting area that uh, we're looking at now and experimenting. I'm going to quickly cover a couple of items from uh, the artificial intelligence side of things because this is another massive area that is very exciting. In some specialities, this is very mature. You can imagine in radiology, that's in X-ray, where there's <coughs> repetitive tasks the machine can do it better than any radiologist can do it. 
we know this we have seen it it's proven and so they are they are you know they're working very hard and and they're well into that process not only that they can take the body and reconstruct let's say you have a growth in your in your liver they can reconstruct that liver to enable the surgeon to actually see where that growth is so that we can actually target it and remove it in cardiology it's very mature this is a paper from the lancet recently saying that uh, artificial intelligence can 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 help the treating uh, specialist target your therapy for a uh, rhythm abnormalities heart rhythm abnormalities and and the treatment for one person is not the same as someone else so how do you know i mean do we just trial it and see and then if it works you well and good otherwise no. but no the artificial intelligence tells us you put in all the numbers uh, the the data scientists and artificial intelligence or the computing power will tell us no for this patient this combination probably will work better now i think that's going to be massively different as i said to you before the in the operating room it's going to help the surgeon let's say you're going to take out a screw or do a hip replacement that you've had previously trouble with you just dial it in and the computer will say okay in the previous 100 operations for this problem this is how we approached it and so you can see it's going to change the operating room as well simple task like sewing so you know the for the surgeon sewing is such an integral part of getting tissue to come together now they are, we are looking at robots to see how can we make the robot do the stitching it's very accurate it can reproduce it it can do it over and over and this work continues now <laughs> and this diagram actually shows the kind of computing uh, uh, ergonomics and stuff that are kinematic models that they put together to work out how exactly to sew. All of this stuff is generating data. So the patient's in the middle and we've got all of this data streaming in, uh, you know, their blood results, their x-rays, their um, it's operating their physios information and everything's coming in and this is called big data and it all comes together and now the data scientists can work on that and computing power as it increases will be able to tailor make a treatment for you specifically it's not about someone else not your your relative or your friend who's had the treatment this treatment is bespoke for you and that is very exciting because it's not target sort of this blind shotgun therapy, it's targeted therapy. Um, there are risks. Yes, there are risks. And, and, and I wanted to highlight that, that, you know, this is the cost for data breaches in the United States. So when we collect the data, we need to be able to protect it because if we don't, we run into problems and because we run into privacy issues and so forth. And so like any, tool if you have a tool you need to know how to use it and 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 protect those assets in that data that could be vulnerable so that's important i don't know about you but uh, recently uh, um, you know uh, we saw this news item elon musk uh, i don't know whether you're uh, elon musk fan or not but uh, i find the man's really fascinating he, he might be a entrepreneur might be a you know, a rich millionaire who's got too much money. But I can tell you there are some thoughts behind how he operates that are really interesting. So Elon Musk announced something. Have a look. Uh, we'll just run the video. Really excited to show you what we've got. I think it's going to blow your mind. One of your senses, your sight, hearing, feeling, um, pain, uh, these are all electrical signals sent by neurons to your brain. But these can all, can all be sold with an implantable neural link. This is sort of what it looks like. <laughs> this is our little device. Uh, it does, that, that thing at the bottom is just to hold the threads in place because they're just like little fine wire, wires. In a lot of ways, it's kind of like a Fitbit in your skull with tiny wires. All you can see afterwards is, is there's a tiny scar. And if it's under your hair, you can't <laughs> see it at all. In fact, I could have a neural link right now and you wouldn't know. Maybe I do. So. Uh, and it's also got all the things that you would expect to see, the sensors you'd expect to see in a smartwatch uh, or a phone. Uh, so there's actually a lot of functions that this device could do uh, related to monitoring your health and warning you about a possible heart attack or stroke or other uh, damage, as well as uh, 
sort of convenience features like playing music. Um, you do a lot. It's sort of like if your phone went at your brain or something. Um, yeah, maybe that's not a great analogy. Um, anyway, so it's also inductively charged. So um, it's charged in the same way that you, char you charge a smartwatch or a phone. Um, and so you can use it all day, uh, charge it at night, and have full functionality. So in terms of getting a link, essentially, uh, you remove uh, about a coin-sized piece of skull, then the robot inserts the electrodes, uh, then the device replaces the portion of skull that was removed, and we, we basically close that up with actually super glue, which is how a lot of wounds are closed. So this is our surgical robot, and we actually ultimately want this robot to do uh, essentially the entire surgery. Uh, so in, in everything from, from in, incision, uh, removing the, the skull, inserting the electrodes, placing the device, um, and then um, closing things up. So does it actually work? Uh, what I'm excited to show you, um, I've called like, the, the three little pigs demo. Well, I'll walk right over and show you. So what we have in pen number one is Joyce, uh, and she does not have an implant. <laughs> Obviously healthy and happy. So here's Dorothy, uh, and in the case of Dorothy, um, Dorothy used to have an implant, and then we removed the implant. So this is uh, an, a very important thing to uh, demonstrate is reversibility. So if you, if you have a neural link, and then you decide you don't want it, or you want to get an upgrade, and the neural link is removed, um, is it removed in such a way that you are still healthy and happy afterwards? <laughs> Man, Gertrude, are you serious? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, the beauty of live demos. This is real live demo. All right, here we go, great, okay. Great. This is a high energy pig. Great. Gertrude, thanks for coming out. Um, so, what you're, the, the beeps you're hearing are real time signals from the neural link in Gertrude's head. So, this neural link connects to neurons that are uh, in her snout. So, whenever she snuffles around and touches something with her snout, uh, that sends out. Uh, neural spikes which are detected here uh, she's had the implant for two months so this is a healthy and happy pig with an implant that is two months old two months old and working well yeah we actually have multiple have um say um one of our pigs on a treadmill really excited to show you what we've got so really what i wanted to show is is where people are working so the ability to pick up these signals uh, is the fact that we can then interpret them, trying to um, work with them uh, and influence them and use it as a, a therapy uh, for um, strokes and, and, and various disorders. Uh, and it opens up these possibilities of, of being able to link brain activity uh, and to be able to influence that, which we really haven't ever had, uh, apart from destroying parts of the brain that are having the patients having fits, we've never been able to manipulate this sort of information. So this is where, again, we're pushing in with technology. So in, in summary, I've given you a little flyover about where technology is going. Uh, it will change healthcare forever. And the next 25 years, it will be unrecognizable. When we look back, we'll wonder, what the hell were we doing then? Uh, and that, that exponential growth is already happening and we need to not lose sight of the fact that what we're looking for is value. That means that it's going to be quality that we're focusing on. We need a cultural change. This, need, this is where there's problems because established uh, <coughs> uh, doctors and, and processes and systems are resistant to change and we need to embrace the, the new technology. Uh, and we need to be excited about it. Now, uh, I want to tell you a story, and this is a very personal story, and there are parts of it that are very hard for me to tell you, but I will tell you that anyway. And this whole idea about what motivates us has really uh, 
uh, interested me for some time. You know, and, and this is the risk as we get older is we, we kind of tell ourselves, well, we've kind of seen it all before. So we'll just uh, play golf and uh, uh, sit behind and let someone else do the stuff that, uh, well, I mean, that, that's, that's not for me to do. And I heard Jack Ma say this. Jack Ma is this multimillionaire who, uh, who was the owner of Alibaba. And, you know, he was a very successful businessman. And I was very disappointed because he said to me, you know, once you reach the age of uh, 50, uh, you're kind of over the hill. So you just take a holiday, get a beach chair and play golf and, and do nothing else. And I was so disappointed. And again, this reminds me that each one of us must not lose sight of the fact that we're here until we are dead, until uh, that event happens, we're alive and we are be passionate and live each day full of uh, uh, passion for what we believe in. Now, medicine and biology is showing us something. We think and we have thought for many years that in medicine, you could, be, it's like a process worker. You, you work harder and the doctor will be paid more. And we're learning from the biology and science and, and that for complex tasks, it simply doesn't work. It's not a good model. If it's a process worker, if it's a repetitive task, yes, incentivizing for the amount of task you do is the right way to go. But for a complex process, that is bad to rely on uh, incentivizing, particularly through money. <coughs> and Someone asked me the other day, you know, so what motivates you to keep, I mean, you're perhaps at the end of your career, but what mot motivates you? And m my motivation is, a, a, you know, it's, it's an intrinsic motivation. I, I don't look for the dollar. I mean, I wouldn't, I'd be stupid to say money is not important. It pays the bills and it looks after my family and does all of that. But that's not the driver. That's not the primary driver. My passion is to really live my life to the max to to do what I'm here to do and make a difference. So backtrack to 1996, I was in the UK, I was in Scotland. I finished my first year of my fellowship uh, in Canterbury in Kent and was looking to come back to Australia and uh, keyhole surgery was just being birthed at that time. And there was a guy in Scotland who's been knighted for his work in surgery, Professor Sir Alfred Cushieri. He's a boxer. He boxed for England, um, giant in uh, the, the area of research, um, a sharp mind, sharp, like a sharp mind as ever. And so I wanted to go and work with him and I rang him up. I remember one winter's you know, morning uh, getting on a train from, Canterbury at five o'clock in the morning, going through King's Cross and then going to, uh, to, to Edinburgh and to Dundee on from there and going on to his office and walking in. And uh, he said to me, he was behind this massive pile of papers, research papers. And he said, okay, I hear from Australia. What, what do you want me to do? What do you want to do? So I said, I want to spend a year with you and I want to learn some of the, some of the new things you're saying uh, and researching and so forth. And he looked at me through his half glasses and I'm, so, you know, and he said, all right, where do you want to start? <laughs> so I, that was my interview. And so I took the next train back. I spent a year in Dundee. <clears throat> and then wanting to come back to Australia, I didn't know where I would come, what, what skills, where would the hospitals be that I'd use the skills that I learned. Anyway, I happened to go to South Australia. They, they rang, I rang up and had an uh, interview on the phone with one of the surgeons there. And he said, well, we have a special project and we're looking for someone very specifically like you that come and teach us uh, some of the new techniques. And so I, well, I went to Adelaide. Uh, my family came back to Melbourne because we had a house. The kids were coming back to school. And we pioneered a new technique for kidney harvesting. So this is the first experience in Australia. That's a paper authored by myself. This is going back, published in April 2002. And this was describing a new technique of taking a kidney out of someone to donate it to someone else having kidney failure. The problem was 
that and the problem is still exists that no one wants to give their kidney because it involves a massive cut and the whole body is opened up and the kidney is harvested. If we can make it more attractive where the downtime is less for that donor, potentially we might have more people willing to donate their kidney. So we pioneered a new technique and I wrote up the first experience uh, of that in Australia. And um, I published that and presented that in Sydney in 2002. And fast forward to 10 years after that, my own son got kidney failure. And so we fronted up to the transplant surgeon. My wife was a suitable donor. And I said to them, so what are you going to, how are you going to take this kidney? And the surgeon sort of broke into this smile and he said, what are you trying to say? Chris, you just told us that we should be taking this kidney using keyhole. And so my wife gave her own kidney using keyhole surgery. Now, the point in all of this is not tell you how fantastic I am, but is that each person needs to understand the, the power of one is not the power of zero. And that we, each one of us has been given a gift to use very, and that's a precious gift. It's ours, it's our responsibility to, to, to look after it, uh, to use it, uh, because you never know what's around the corner. I'm gonna stop there and I thank you once again, Mahendra, for uh, allowing me to talk. And I hope I gave you a little flyover presentation about where the future is going uh, and uh, and I'm happy to take questions uh, if there are any. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Appreciate it. Well, please, uh...